So I'll just say a quick hello before I put the um, screen share up, but I'm very happy to speak to you all. And it's a topic that I would expect you haven't had many lectures on, if any. So I'm delighted to give a topic that's that's new to, to people. Um, and you, I hope you share with me that this is really quite an exciting new technology. So I'm going to share my screen and make it full size. Am I full size? She's great. Yeah, I'm good. So here's, here's the name of the topic. Cone beam breast CT. Um, so this is me, um, which Dr. Brem just said. So now I'm going to start into the actual topic. So why do we, why do we screen for cancer? Well, as you all know very well, it, breast cancer is the number one cancer in women and worldwide it is the number one cause of cancer death. If I was in person, I'd say you all know what the number one, number one cause of cancer death in this country is breast, is, is lung and breast is number two. But anyway, so it's a very important uh, health uh, problem, as you know. 40,000 women is a lot of women to still die. So we all know that our job is to find cancer. And so we try to find cancer when it's small, very small. And as you all know, it means better treatment, better survival, sometimes lumpectomy versus, you know, less. And this is all pretty obvious and you know all this, but I'm leading up to my point. So um, less invasive surgery, left, less uh, digging around in the axilla, um, less radiation, and sometimes less or no chemo. So small cancers, we all know this. Now, but what is the perfect tool to screen for breast cancer um, and to be effective and efficient? So not too many false positives or false negatives. And how about this painlessly thing? You know, we generally ignore the fact that we we don't re, we we've nothing better. So and women will say to you, look, if you find my cancer, I don't care how much pain it is. But then some people will say, no, it's too much pain. I don't think I'm going to come. I don't have any risk factors. It's a very bad argument. I have no risk factors, so I can't get breast cancer. So you all know that at least three quarters of uh, women with breast cancer don't have risk factors. So so let, comfortable would be would be nice and nobody can say a mammogram is comfortable some people complain more or less so that's another thing and we all know again that the sensitivity of mammography is not anywhere close to 100 percent. the denser the breast the less the sensitivity and of course on with extremely dense breasts i mean the sensitivity is way down um and at least 40 percent of women in this country do have dense breasts so it's a lot of people for whom the sensitivity of mammography is very poor and i and you um, again, as a breast imaging um, audience, you know that the risk of fatty fatty versus the relative risk of cancer is increased in the very dense breasts compared to the fatty breasts. All of this you know, but I'm just emphasizing the fact that mammography is not that great. Um, it's the best thing we've got, no question. But it's not well. We'll get to that. And um, so the gold standard, of course, is mammography. And it has, again, the statistics are familiar to all of you, um, been the uh, clear association with reduced cancer deaths over the last 20 years. And um, people argue about that, but it's true. And then, um, of course, when we add screening ultrasound to screening mammography, we add another probably four per thousand. And then we add MRI, we add more, maybe five per thousand or more. But is there a better way we could do this? Um, we can't screen everybody with MRIs. Maybe if we did, abbreviated MRI, but that's that's hard. You know, there's there's barriers to that. So here's where I digress a little and say, if you came from another planet and you were shown a woman's breast, large, soft, and fairly sensitive, and you were asked to design an ideal tool to image this breast, to find something small and white in a three-dimensional soft structure where the only black thing is fat, which is benign, and everything else is white, cysts, normal tissue, everything, and cancer. So I usually show a Where's Waldo slide right here, where you make Waldo black and white, and then you find Waldo. It's, it's really a difficult job. And the reason we're doing mammography is that that's what we've been doing. Um, and so, you know, we need to think sometimes, is there something we could do differently? Now we'd have to match it up and do at least as well as what we've got currently, but that's the, um, that's the, that's the, the project to see if we do something different. So what we do now, we take that nice 3D structure and we compress it to make it from three, with our compression plates, we can transform it into a 2D structure with a lot of pressure variable. And then we do it more than once. 
And then if we see something, we do more spots and mags and everything, all with compression, all extra views. Then this unfortunate woman, <laughs> you know, is maybe gets ultrasound, then maybe biopsy. And then, then this is like, we, 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 you know, it, it's, it's tough. And women will put up with just about everything if we promise, which we can't, to find something. So here now I introduce my, my topic. We're 10 minutes into the talk and here's the, um, what a, a cone beam machine looks like. So it's a, it's a CT machine with an opening through which the breast will hang dependent. And um, we do one breast at a time and it's a single sweep. And in here, you, you'll see in the next image that there's a gantry that opens and all the machinery is down below, no compression. So here's a little thing of, this woman needs to put a gown on because we, we have, <laughs> our, our patients will have a gown, but this little movie thing will show you. So the lady climbs up and she, positions herself. Now, this is a thing. She positions herself. She's co totally covered, except for the breast that's underneath. And then underneath, you can see that um, the 360 degree sweep. So it's a perfect isotropic image that that comes after. Let me just run that again. So it's a um, so the machinery, you open the doors, the full thing is the full machinery is down under and the and there's a 360 sweep. Now we position the lady in a slightly oblique position. She leans in, she basically positions herself. Then we peek on under to make sure everything is straight. And then we take the image. Now, this is where I would again diverge and say, in some cultures, what we do in a mammogram is not acceptable. You know, um, a compression mammogram requires a lot of handling of the breast. And there are people in some countries where I've gone to give these talks who really, the idea that even a woman would handle somebody else's breasts or anybody else is against their culture. So the idea would be that the woman would wear her gown, she would position herself on the table and she would position her breast into the opening. And about it's about as covered as you could be. And so I, you know, I think it's acceptable for that reason to some cultures. So anyway, so the dedicated breast CT does a single view quotes, acquisition in 360 degrees takes 10 seconds. That's it, 10 seconds. And the isotropic resolution is, is um, the regular resolution is, is 0.273 millimeter. So very 0.2, we'll call it to round it up. And then the, um, it can be reconstructed with the high resolution to 2.1 millimeter, which is a hundred microns, which as you know, from your mammogram, is about the size of a lot of the calcifications we're looking at. So 100 micron resolution means that cal calcifications are now um, well imaged. And um, so because of the way it's done, it's, it's more similar to an MRI than anything else really. And you all know, of course, that MRI is not at all something for calcium. So it's everything else, but not calcium. So this, this device could, or this, this procedure could indeed substitute for MRI if we got to that point. And um, it's certainly more, well, it's more comfortable than the mammogram. It's in some ways because of the claustrophobia and the length of time and um, the MRI, it may not be more comfortable than an MRI, but it is faster and um, it's not noisy. It's a 10 second scan. So for both breasts, the bilateral exam, you know, less than 10 minutes. So in terms of um, numbers of patients and ease of exam, it's got a lot of advantages, if you like, over MRI. So that comes to another topic I'll have later. How does it compare with the images? And I'll show you those shortly. So fast scan, right. So, and it's, it's way less expensive. Of course, the machine is less expensive to begin with. And the exam is less expensive. And I know we have abbreviated MRI now, which has dropped the cost, but it's still, um, you know, comparable and in, 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 in the images and less costly in many ways. Plus getting time on a scanner isn't always something we all can have access to. So the capabilities then, um, excellent for dense breasts because there's no overlap. There's no compression. So all that, all that um, false positives from uh, compression overlap it does not happen. Um, good for calcifications because, as I said, the standard resolution is 0.2 millimeter cubed and the high resolution is 0.1. And remember, this is perfect isotropic resolution. So every in every direction, and I'll show you those, if it's a C, transverse 90, every way, the same resolution. It's perfect resolution in all planes. So um, I like to say that the unit of imaging is a tiny voxel measuring 0.273. And that can be improved with the, with the um, um, reconstructions. So 
Um, and again, microcalx on MAMO is about the size where this resolution can do. Um, and it's good for masses and it's, it's also good for asymmetries, right? So there's gonna be pictures quite soon, pictures. Okay, we're into the pictures. So the pictures really are, um, this, the first one, I, I, these are not in any particular order of like, anyway. Anyway, this is a good example for us that the patient was in a study and she had a mammogram and a cone beam CT the same day. So here was her mammogram. She was in her 80s. She knew she had this lump. And just I'll have you note that the distance between the back of the cancer and the chest wall on the CC view, particularly on the CC view. So then she had her cone beam and it comes up with four a four four way image where this top left one is her the equivalent to the CC. So that's her CC view. Now gravity helps. So we actually sorry, we actually get more tissue behind the breast because she's hanging, the breast is hanging and gravity gives us an improved posterior. This is the CC equivalent. This is the transverse. Now this is the 90 equivalent. And I will point out to you also that there's a little limb. So we have nice pectoral muscle and you'll see there's a lymph node pops in here, which we did not see on our mammogram, this one. So it wasn't that important, but it just shows you that the coverage was excellent. And then this is the view that you can't get any other way. This is a coronal view. Now, this we love this coronal view. As you know, when you reconstruct your MRIs, you know exactly where the lesion is. Um, so that's a bonus view that you get, and it's equal resolution to all the others. Now, this, this is the beauty. This is the 3D reconstruct, and this is the mass. Now, when you show this to a patient, they can understand better what's in their breast. If you show it to a surgeon, they have a better idea of how to plan their surgery. There are so many benefits from, if nothing else, this, this 3D reconstruct, and I think I have a full. I'll show you, there's lots more of these. So anyway, these are the standard four images that we display from that one 10 second acquisition. And then we can play with them every which way. So here's the screening exam. This was back in a study where a person had a mammogram and they agreed to a CT as well, not contrast. So here is this lady's mammogram and those bright eyes in the group have probably spotted the cancer. But since I'm not in the same room, I won't put anybody on the spot. But anyway, there's a cancer in one of these breasts and easier on the MLO, but on the CC, it's not so, I mean, I've looked at this so many times. I know exactly where it is, but you know, it's not, you know, it's there. We did all the right things even on the, we had done the mammogram. She'd got, actually wasn't the same day. She came back a different day. So here's her CT. So I will, now this is the other beauty of this, this, um, this um, technique is you drop a crosshair on anything you're looking at and the crosshair co-registers in every view. So here it is on the CC, that's the transverse. This is the equivalent to the 90. This is the coronal. And I don't have, and then, then my next view would be the, 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 the spinner. So there's the lesion on the 3D reconstruct. And here's the, the movie clip, which again, not contrast, but you can see exactly where it is. And it was small, it was I think seven millimeters. So it was a beautiful example of a screening um, mass by cone beam and really pretty pictures. So. So that's how you, so you do that when you're reading them, you click each one and you um, you click each view you're interested in and you run the, like here, you you know, if I had it in, on, on real real time, I could click any one of these and, and then um, run it through with the TOMO, with the CT. Okay, so just in case you didn't believe me, that's where the cancer was. <laughs> you probably all saw it. So anyway. Now, calcifications, so early on with this, there were two questions. People said, CT, no, no, too much radiation. So I'll tell you about that in a moment. And then like, how good is it for calcifications? Because if you're gonna use this for screening, we all know that if you can't see calcifications on a screening exam, you're gonna miss a lot of DCIS. So here's an example, cherry picked of course, of a mammogram with, with um, uh, pleomorphic calcifications over quite a large area. And yeah, we can, do all kinds of extra views to, to map that out. But then here's what happened on her CT. You can see, again, if you were showing that to the surgeon so they could plan their surgery, um, you know, it shows you exactly the shape of the of where it's going. This is again without contrast. I have some with contrast, which are even more dramatic. But if you were just planning the surgery uh, for that, and yes, we can do locs with it too. Um, our surgeons. We have a new surgeon and I'm going to be trying to get her involved soon. But right now, 
but you know we can biopsy we can put um put needle oaks in and everything we do on mammal right so now i'm just going to back up and do a little comment you know a little kind of summary thing so single acquisition sweep 300 perfect 360 degree right and then i like this this is this is my favorite thing you manipulate the image, not the patient. You don't bring the patient back and do extra this and extra that and extra other. Once you have one really good image, you can do everything on the image and not have to, you know, punish the patient. But so, um, and then, as I said earlier, the re then it can be reconstructed to resolution up to 0.1 millimeter cubed, which is pretty good. So, and then I love the fact that you can co-register the finding. You find any lesion, so you don't have to worry. Is that asymmetry the same on the, you see it on one view, you're not 100% sure. Now the TOMO helps, of course, but you still have some times where you're not 100% sure which, which, what, where it is on the other view. So here's one that was, um, so there's a, this is a mammogram, obviously, and there's something going on in the, uh, in the upper breast here. And then, you know, when you first look at, you think, oh, there's a lot of density there. And then there's something there. So again, eagle eyes in the audience have probably already decided, but here's the cone beam um, without contrast. And you can see quite clearly that it's certainly in the upper and it's right there on the CC and it's here on the coronal. So this is great if you have to go in with your ultrasound, you know exactly where to look. And then the 3D. Now here's the 3D, which I have enlarged here. So this is not with contrast. So this shows exactly where it is. And then, so pretty obvious where it is. Again, you can biopsy or you can go after it with ultrasound and then go to the next step. Now, this is the same case. Now, of course, contrast is like you switch the light bulb on. So you put in contrast and then it jumps, right? I mean, you know, I'll get to the point where how could we be imaging for cancer and not giving contrast? I mean, where else in the body, in the kidney, would you ever do a kidney scan for cancer and not give contrast? You know, there's very few cancers where we don't give contrast. So, and I know we're starting to do an MRI, of course, and the contrast mammo, of course, but we need to know that for dense breasts, we need, we probably need contrast. So here's the contrast exam. So it, it's even more so. So, um, so that's my point on that one. This is to prove that that was the lesion, that it was in the upper and it was in the inner, not there. Sorry, this, this is not the next case. So that was just to prove that that was the finding and she was biopsied and it was cancer, obviously. But looking now, all we've done is a needle biopsy. And really that cancer is not as, remember what the mass looked like, this thing? And then it's this thing. So yeah, there's a lot we're not seeing. So as we all know, and it, I don't want to sound like I'm beating up mammography. It is the gold standard and it is what we do every single day. And we find an awful lot of cancers. But here we're, we're talking about, could we do something different? So sensitivity is low and um, masking effect from compression. And um, we're not even going to go into uncomfortable, except that some studies have said that women don't come back because they don't like it, the pain. On the other hand, there are women who say they have no care how much pain you give so long as you find that cancer and they don't die like their mother, sister, friend. So the uncomfortable is not 100% negative, um, but it would be nice if it wasn't. So, so here's an example of a BIRED zero, a dense breast with an asymmetry. Now this one, I'd be pretty sure that there's going to be something. There's a round sort of asymmetry here and there's kind of something here, but um, so, is it real? So is it a true positive or a false positive or what? So the normal mammogram of workup would be, these would be spots of course, spots CC with TOMO and MLO, maybe 90, maybe an ultrasound and everything. So I'm just going to show you two clips of her cone beam. Now you can go back and forth so many times, that'll be the, the transverse image. Um, and you go back and forth any number of times. And where's the other one? So I, we have one view and then we have same thing. So we did, you know, if you look carefully and spend as much time as you like um, with both views and you stop it anytime you like and look back and forth. So you do all of that. And of course, at the time we did ultrasound as well. And at the end of the day, there was nothing. So this was dense breasts with a false positive. So um, would we have been secure enough with the um, CT? Well, over time you get comfortable with new technology. Like with Tomo, we got better. So yeah, in this case, it was a false positive. Now, the next case I'm going to, I already said this, that we definitely need contrast for breast imaging. And of course we know that, and we know that MRI is the most sensitive and that we're now doing, a lot of us are doing contrast mammography as well. But 
Let me just say that for contrast mammography compared with cone beam, because that's where my talk is, um, the patient is upright. She has to be compressed twice per side. And you have to, you know, and the timing is, an, you know, the timing is not an issue, but you just have to hustle. So you do the CC or whatever, then you go the other side, and then you go back and then you go back. So how much nicer to, and I'll come to that in a sec, how much nicer if you could do it just once? And then, you know, when we do the contrast, the timing is exact. You give the contrast, you wait two minutes, we start the scan. So the timing is, is so much easier when you, um, when you don't have to do two views. Now, here's something that way back when I started doing this, believe it or not, the famous Dr. Copans thought, because he was one of the advisors very much earlier, many, many years ago. And he thought that the flow, the vascularity around a tumor or a mass might actually be, by looking at it in very high resolution, might actually um, tell us things about whether it's malignant or not. So he thought that the vascularity, quite apart from enhancing the mass, he thought the vessels feeding, if you like, a mass may actually um, be, um, be telling us something. Um, we haven't done any studies on that, but I mean, when you get high resolution and you zoom in around a tumor, um, it would be a while before we'd not do a biopsy based on something like that, but it's, it's certainly something worth studying. And then the timing, I just said, for, for the contrast mammo, you have to time the two sides to make sure you get you know, the flow in all of them. So that's contrast mammo, which is definitely, a le I mean, I'm first to say it's a lot easier to up, upgrade your, um, your Tomo machine, add in the new filter, and then train everybody on contrast, and you can be doing contrast mammo you know, very quickly. Um, but again, these would be the drawback um, if you had a choice. But if you don't have a choice, it's certainly better, way better than a plain mammal. And it's not as um, tricky to get as an MRI for some people. So now I'm going to show you an example. This, I love this case. This, was, I, this may have been our very first contrast case. It was a, an older lady who was skin and bone, but her breasts were solid density. And there was a mass in this breast. Now that's kind. This is her non-contrast CT, but her mammo looked pretty well the same, just totally dense. And this was her contrast study. Wait till you see. And when she had her mastectomy, I sent this picture to the pathology department, and it was exactly that. It was like half the breast was studded with cancer, and the other half was not. Look, so it was a very dramatic um, example. And here are the four views. So you can see for extent of disease. Some people can't have an MRI, some people, you know, whatever, but this is actually, a, I, th I thought, a very dramatic for one of our first cases. It's like, oh yeah, we're definitely doing the right thing. So, so I'm moving on. So here I'm going to say true 3D. Um, now the breast is a 3D structure, obviously, and compression makes it into a 2D. And oh, I've said all this. Now, what I was trying to say about the tomosynthesis is the tomosynthesis is not really 3D, it's a reconstruction into 3D. So it's a pseudo 3D. Um, so it can't be the perfect resolution in all the planes. So I'm just saying that from the technical point of view, TOMO is not really true 3D. It's hard to say that, take your teeth out, true 3D, but it's not truly 3D. It is 2D reconstructed to 3D. So, and it still of course has compression and two views per side. So, um, but no question, it's a better mammogram. And um, then, of course, after that, we have whole breast ultrasound, and we're lucky enough to be getting the um, soft view 3D Tomo ultrasound here in the next few weeks. Um, but we still want to correlate. If we see something on a mammogram, on, on a breast ultrasound, we all go, we're not really going to not do an ultrasound. Pe some, I mean, a mammogram. People come in and say, oh, if the ultrasound adds more cancers, why don't we just skip the mammogram? But we all have to it's, argue the patient back to say, no, no, the mammo needs to be done as well. But the ultrasound will add more cancers in dense breasts uh, than the mammogram. And it's really quite dramatic. You do a screening mammogram, you pick up your, what, four to six per thousand. It's unbelievable, really, that if you do a whole breast ultrasound and add another almost four, four per thousand, and then MRI as well, there's a lot of cancer in there that we're not finding. So again, um, ultrasound, um, you know, has a lot of false positives. Again, we're, we're getting better. When we started doing whole breast ultrasound, of course, that original study out of Connecticut was like nine, what was it, nine? Anyway, it was a huge, because huge number of biopsies that were benign. So we were, we're definitely better. And of course, we know it's not good for calcification. So we want a, um, 
technology that's good for calcifications, good in dense breasts, and can have contrast, and um, then we'll have our best options. So of course, as, as, as we have MRI, and of course it's prone, there are contraindications for people, you know, the usual um, Im embedded devices, they can't have it. People, and people hate, some people can't stay in that tunnel, they just can't do it. Um, and then it does have contrast, which is great. And I'm not going to argue about Gadovis versus Omnipake because I think the original worries about deposition in the brain really have not held up. And with the um, the newer um, contrast agents, um, the, uh, we're, we're not worried about deposition in the brain. Um, and of course, MRI is very expensive and the MRI machine is very expensive. So these are the reasons why it'd be nice to have an alternative so long as it's not inferior, which is the buzzword, right? And then of course we have abbreviated MRI, which some places are using, and it definitely gives you the benefits of the MRI without some of the costs. But so that is definitely a newer uh, option. So um, so here's, I'm gonna show you some pictures of CT versus MRI. So they're both prone. I just kind of said this mostly, but MRI, 40 minutes table time, I'm told you can do three an hour on the abbreviated, but the CT is still shorter than that. It's 10 minutes for both sides. So it's not a race for time, but I mean, the time on the abbreviated is definitely better, but the CT is still better. And then the cost is, I don't know what people are charging for the abbreviated, but um, the cost is times 10 is for a regular MRI. Um, I imagine the um, I think most people are charging about 500 for the abbreviated and the abbreviated is shorter in time and shorter in cost. So that's a benefit. So I'm going to show you some pictures. This is a really nice one. So this first left sided picture here is a regular mammogram with the BB marking a mass, 40, 45 year old with a mass in her breast. And um, it, it then gets biopsied. Then she has her MRI. So you see the, um, ar the artifact from her biopsy here. And then but this is the MRI, so there's contrast now. So you see the mass, oh, sorry. Uh, but you can see that there's tracking towards the nipple, which it's good to know because the mammogram isn't telling you that. Now here's the CT um, without contrast. It's not any better than the mammogram, but here's this, oh, you know, I, it's under my, this one. Um, let me get rid of this. So the CT here um, is pretty well the same as the MRI. You can see the mass and then you can see the tracking towards the nipple. So the contrast CT is giving us the information that we got in the MRI. So that's nice uh, to have. Now, the next one is also, um, it's a patient with calcification. So of course, DCIS, you got it on the mammogram, you got it on the mammogram. And then this is the contrast, um, let me move this. Then this is the contrast where you can see all of the, so it, you know, we say oftentimes casually that DCIS won't always show on an MRI, and um, well, of course, high grade does. But here, here you can see that maps out the extent of the malignancy, and there seems to be a sort of a mass-like effect here as well, which is on the mammogram, but it's not something that until the contrast goes in, you can't really um, appreciate that as much. So that's a pretty good extent of disease CT, and um, very similar to an MR. So the MRI here. And the con non-contrast, so you can see the calcium shows very nicely. And then here, um, the CT con with contrast is every bit as good as the MR. So, and here's the video clip to show you. Now, again, if you're showing this to a surgeon, they can, they love this because they can see, right? You stop here, you say you got to get that and you got all this and you got all this. So they have a much better idea what they're going in for. Um, so the surgeons love this 3D. They really love it for obvious reasons, because you can imagine planning the surgery. Surgeons love that. Let me just briefly, fairly briefly, just mention the resolution of this. So on a 3T MRI, the resolution in plane will be down to 0.8 of a millimeter. And um, it'll be less, of course, on a 1.5. But the cone beam, the um, resolution, which I keep hammering resolution because it's really important, 0.2 is the standard res. And then, so of course we get sharper images. And then the high res is up to 0.1, so 100 microns. So from the resolution point of view, it's hard to beat. And of course, contrast plus better resolution should be a winning combination. Now I'm going to just show you a couple of, expand your ideas now. this. I'm married to a plastic surgeon. And when he saw these pictures, it was like, wow. So um, why, is, why are people not doing this for all reconstructions and implants and volume assessments? So let me show you why. So here's the implant. 
So he could give this talk because he travels with me for a lot of these talks. So implants, right? Normally we do the CC, we do the pushback, the MLO, the pushback, right? Four views. So here's where an implant would look. Where's my... So routine screening. Okay, we do all the ID views. Okay, I'm coming. So here's the cone beam um, with one single sweep. And then uh, the next one shows. So then if you're a plastic surgeon and you think the implant has been shrinking, well, only if it's a silicone, or you want to balance out the volume of the two breasts, you can do all kinds of information with this. So from the surgical point of view and planning, and even if it's not cancer, you know, if somebody has asymmetric sizes and you're trying to calculate what size of an implant to order, well, they usually have them all in the OR anyway, but you can see how um, scanning, screening a person who has implants um, would be an awful lot um, more makes more sense, you know, and if it's got the same result, this is a really good way to screen. I have to say, FDA has not approved for screening yet. We'll talk about that in the questions maybe, but, you know, this would be the thing. It's approved for diagnostic, but not for screening. So if they have a problem, we can do it. So, okay, here we go. I'm going to show you a couple more examples um, of things you should, you know, things you didn't know about this technology. Biopsy capability is there. The, the table rises, raised, can be raised up and you can target the asymmetry of the mass. It's very similar in a way um, to an MR biopsy. Um, evaluate, I've already said that um, that is a potential benefit, the vasculature around a tumor. So we can biopsy, we can do studies on the tumor vascularity. And then here's what it looks like. So the table can be raised up. And then the gantry is opened and this grid can be put on the lateral side of the breast or whichever side you want it on. So biopsy capability, again, very similar to how you would do an MR biopsy. And I'm thinking, because we're starting contrast mammo quite soon, and we won't have biopsy device for that, that if we find something on the contrast mammo, then this will be perfect. And, you know, if it doesn't show an ultrasound, that we will be able to biopsy those findings, which will be a very nice, um, you know, project to work on. So here's how they look. You, you do the single sweep and you have your grid. And just like you would with an MR, you pick your lesion. Here you can see the thickness of the breast, the depth of the lesion, and then you pick which, which opening you go into and away, away you go. And so, so this is where I kind of like to just do a little retrospective. So imaging evolves over time. Well, that's a good statement, right? So Rankin, 1895, right? And then we've had plain x-rays radiographs, right? Then I'm, I'm leading up to something, linear TOMO, nobody around is old enough to know about. IVP was TOMO back in the day. But linear TOMO is, is something we did, and we were very proud of it, and it was good. Then we did CT, and we never went back to linear TOMO. So, and of course we have MR. And then Dr. Brem knows very well, there's molecular imaging and PET and all these other things, which, which are available, but we keep trying to find something better, different, you know. So, that's the nice thing about science. It, it keeps getting better. You just have to keep your mind open. So I'm going to, show, I love this case. I just can't tell you how much I love this case. Patient with hematuria had an IVP back in the day. So you had your IVP in your local radiology office, your friendly local radiology office. This is equivalent to the plain film. This is the scout image. And then you did your um, contrast. Oh no, then you did your TOMO scout. There's your linear TOMO. Then you gave contrast and you did, the to you did your, your TOMO views. And tomo views. You did your, yeah, your tomo views. Now, this person has hematuria. The right breast looks reasonably okay. You think you see all the margins? Huh. Well, reasonably okay. The left side, not so much. There's something going on, big mass in the breast. So what do you do? Um, then you send to the central, everybody didn't have a CT in every corner office back then. So then you sent into the hospital to get the CT and look at it. I mean, would you ever go back? So this upper this, this huge tumor on the left side. And did you see the cyst coming on the right? You didn't really. So the idea, you know, we have progressed. And once we get to a better technology, we can usually drop one of the prior ones. So nobody does IVPs and TOMOs now. We do CTs with contrast. So um, it's a, a great example of how, you know, other parts of the body are doing this. And um, so here's where I'm going to just kind of wrap up a few of the highlights here. And um, dedicated breast CT is perfect positioning for contrast. So the patient's lying on the table prone. The arm can be out. You can have the IV in. The contrast is what we know and love. I automated, you know, omnipaque, whatever. And it's ready to go. And um, so, and then now really 
from the few cases I showed, you can imagine that you could reduce some of the BIRAD zeros. So you can downgrade the BIRADs. Some of the recalls, I know we're doing that with TOMO, but some of the recalls won't have to happen. So there'll be less zeros for recall. And um, you may need less ultrasound again down, you know, using less technology. This one technology would maybe replace the callback for MAMO. I'm not sure if, I think we'd still do ultrasound, certainly for a while. I'd, I like to see the ultrasound. And um, it might do less BIRADS 3s if we, you know, are confident in the finding. We don't have to do as many BIRADS 3s. And then maybe less BIRADS 4s if we're sure with the contrast, because there will be contrast patterns. Like on a, if you did an MRI in every fibroadenoma, you would biopsy less of them. So you could reduce the number of biopsies. So any time we can downgrade a BIRADS is a plus. So, so this is, so in summary, I submit to you, maybe it's better than a regular mammogram. Maybe it's better than TOMO because it's real 3D, real isotropic 3D rather than reconstructed 3D. Now, let me just say again, I know and love the mammogram and the TOMO. I'm just saying this is my talk. So I have to say, could it be better than, could it be not inferior to, I mean, I've shown pictures where it's as good as, but non-inferior to MRI. And then it is part of the evolution of imaging. Um, to see what we can do better. So that's, I think, how I, oh, discuss, right? That's my, that's my last slide. Right. So I'm going to stop screen sharing and then see, has anybody got any questions?